Hello, and welcome to Engaging Leaders in Knowledge, sponsored by the NASA Academy of Program Project and Engineering Leadership and the Chief Knowledge Office. I'm Ed Hoffman, NASA's Chief Knowledge Officer, speaking to you from NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. These are events that are designed to bring together leaders and knowledge experts from the federal agencies, from industry, from our international partners, and from academia to talk about some of the state-of-the-art events and issues that are facing us as we try to get the work that we do done and to particularly provide best practices and insights into how we approach what we're doing for the NASA mission. This event specifically focuses on the management and the development of talent uh, in the federal workforce and we have a two-part program here. The first part will feature our keynote, Terry Cook Davies, who's done uh, outstanding research into what we need to know about how organizations work effectively, uh, particularly engineering and programmatic organizations. And then in the second part, we'll have a distinguished panel of leaders from the FBI, the U.S. Office of Personnel Management, and NASA to talk about specific applications and approaches of developing and managing talent. One of the things that I'd say is that this is a virtual session, so we will have interaction and questions. For those who are using Twitter, you can use hashtag NASA Elk, N-A-S-A-E-L-K, to send questions to us. And if you're following us on Apple's Facebook page, you can go to facebook.com slash NASA Apple, all one word, and submit your questions that way. And we'll track them and answer uh, as many as we can as we go through it. So let me uh, turn to introducing our guest. I am very excited to be on this uh, program with Terry Cook Davis. Terry and I have known each other for probably close to 20 years. And Terry is one of the individuals. I've heard him speak many, many times. And every time he talks, I find it of interest and fascinating, uh, partly because he does his work uh, in sharing knowledge and working with organizations and leaders. We're sharing actual, real experiences. And second of all, he is one of the only organizations that I really know also links that to quantitative research, true research analysis. And Terry will be talking about success through people. And it's my pleasure to introduce you to Terry Cook Davies, who is the chairman of Human Systems International and has benchmarked and conducted research, uh, both as a practitioner running organizations and businesses, uh, but also understanding how projects get done. So, Terry, welcome to uh, welcome to NASA and to engaging you, uh, leaders in knowledge. And uh, want to get started uh, with you, uh, maybe stimulating us with some of the research that you've been doing and uh, talking about, you know, what have you found? about being successful in an organization today. Uh, great, thanks Ed. Um, I'm, and I'm, first of all, if I may, I'd like to say how excited I am to be here, uh, particularly on the occasion of this particular event, because it seems to me that it's absolutely timely that as um, the federal government, as well as the governments of UK and other Western countries, comes to terms with um, the changed economic circumstances, we're finding that more and more project and program uh, uh, format is used for the work of delivering strategy, delivering organizational strategy in all formats. And my background, as you know, is in, in program and project management. I'm not an expert in HR uh, uh, management, as we um, will be hearing from Jerry and Catherine later, and nor am I an expert in knowledge management, as we're going to hear from Gervis later. But what I do have is a, um, a lot of data from organizations obtained both through academic research and through practical benchmarking of precisely what they do in order to deliver success through people. So I think it's, uh, it's absolutely appropriate. If I can see the next uh, chart, please. What I'm going to be talking about today really is four things. I want to start off by, something that's, by talking about something that's very close to NASA's heart, I think, which is uh, program management and of large engineering projects and some new work that's been done uh, in that area. And I think that's going to set the scene for the importance of success through people. Then I want to move on and, and talk about the whole aspect of program management as it's embedded in its organizational context, which is where I think we start to see the federal um, government 
uh, primarily involved because there were more and more of the agencies will find themselves doing more and more of their work in the form of projects and programs over the next few years. Um, then thirdly, I want to share some of the results of a benchmarking study that we've done on good practice in terms of developing people to deliver success through people and the tie of that to knowledge management. And then lastly, I want to share some really significant challenges that I think all project and program based organizations are facing in the world today. So does that sound like a reasonable sounds, range of things to do? Uh, on the way through, I'll probably draw out some, uh, some tips for federal agencies as I go, but rather than making the story around the 10 tips for federal agencies, I'll draw them out as the data shows it. Mm. So if we can uh, move on. Uh, I, I've got a particular uh, um, pleasure in talking about this first program because uh, in July of last year, I was um, uh, flattered and fortunate enough to be invited by INCOSI the International Council for Systems Engineers to give a keynote talk at their annual meeting which happens to be in Rome which is why I've produced that picture of uh, um, one, one of the arches in the Colosseum um, um, uh, Hadrian, um, Arch, uh, Trajan's Arch I think in the Colosseum um, and they were talking about a piece of really major research done jointly by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and INCOSI and PMI the Project Management Institute and I think in terms of today's topic, you couldn't ask for a better run into what we're going to talk about. So if I can look at the next uh, um, chart, I think that any of the NASA people who are watching this will recognize this list of 10 of the most common challenges that you encounter in engineering programs. I'm sure that you've all encountered the need for firefighting. Um, indeed, uh, you make an art form of it. If I think about movies like Apollo 13, it is entirely about firefighting when you're faced with uh, um, uncontrollable situations that need to be brought under control. But I'm sure that people will also recognize the problems of unclear roles, of um, insufficient planning, um, of not having the right metrics, all the kind of lists that are on these list of ten items. Now, what's a... Uh, um, this research showed, if I can move on to the next one, is that these actually aren't independent variables. Each of them has knock-on effects to the other. For example, if you're spending all of your time firefighting, the quality of long-range planning you're doing is going to suffer. Uh, similarly, if you, if you aren't very clear about roles and responsibilities, you're not really likely to align the organization with the um, enterprise uh, and its overall strategies. And if this alignment isn't happening, you're going to be introducing unintended risks. So there's a whole series of knock-on effects. So what's interesting is how do you then make sense of that about where to start? And if we can move on, please, and see if we take those 10 challenges, one of the things we can do, let's just shrink that down so that we're seeing uh, a, a more reasonable label for them and then let's have a look at the number of arrows going out of each one and the number of arrows coming into each one and if we roll that across we can see that uh, you've actually got a difference between some of them that are more driven by others and some of them that are doing the driving and if we then sort those in terms of the balance of which are the ones that are doing the driving so that you can influence as opposed to which are the ones that are driven by then you can see right up there in the number two position, as we'll see with a red bar in a moment, I think, um, that competency and knowledge turns out to be one of the two factors, along with acquisition practices, that you can influence independently of the individual programs. Now, it does seem to me that we've got a very, very important point here. One of them is that since these kind of factors can affect your performance in any project or program, the first tip I would make about, uh, about talent management is that talent management, when you're talking about project-based organizations, doesn't only relate to the top of the organization. You need to have the talented person leading every project and program because every project and program has the use of people and their competence and knowledge as absolutely one of its critical success factors. So if the federal agencies are seeking to build talent in, a prog in, in an organization that's doing a large number of projects and programs, then it's essential that their talent management goes right deep to all levels so that they can end up with the right people leading the right projects wherever they happen to be. So, 
just to be clear, so what it sounds like your research is saying is that a starting point is make sure you have good acquisition practices in place. And I assume that means that everything's being done through supply side and industry and different organizations. Well, and, the and, and that you're setting the right culture. And, competencies, knowledge, and the correct roles. and Exactly. Okay. Exactly. The acquisition is really important because that, that plays into the kind of culture that you're going to, mm. um, that you're, you're going to develop. Uh, many major program has failed because the acquisition practices have encouraged a claims culture so that instead of getting on with the job, people uh, em employ lawyers to sue each other instead of working together to deliver the program. So you can see that acquisition is really important to setting the background, but that's all it does, it sets the background. Mm -hmm. You've then got to have the right people who are, who are leading it, as you say. And, and this piece of research, which I think is really interesting being done jointly by three different organizations, actually tallies with what our own research has shown. Um, if I can see the next picture, this shows we did a similar job here. Um, on something over 200 projects that we benchmarked and we found that the most significant factor in any of them was whether the project manager is competent for the particular job so here's here's two bits of information from very different sources both of which add up to saying that the most important element of delivering success is having the right people do it so there's the first of the four points that I would really like to to make today I want to change gear a bit now because I want to think a little bit about the context in which you're doing projects and programs. Because uh, projects and programs, you can think of a project or a program as being a standalone entity, but in reality, they're all done by groups of people that are embedded in organizations. And if we look at the next chart, we're th 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 this, there's a whole lot of information contained within this. Um, Mark, we can move on to... Uh, there we go. Um, th this is a an adaptation of, of a picture of an organization uh, done by a colleague of mine, Lynn Crawford, and it's based on an adaptation of a diagram in the uh, standard for portfolio management. It's, it's significant because it shows that the way any organization, be it part of the federal uh, government or be it a private enterprise, delivers its strategy is through a mixture of managing its ongoing operations and managing its change programs, its projects and its programs. The difference is that when you're looking at projects and programs, these really are temporary structures that operate like a cuckoo within the nest of the business as a whole, and they develop their own, uh, their own culture, and if you aren't careful, then they don't get themselves embedded correctly. We, we, we tend not to give credence to this to the extent that we should, because if we move on to the next picture, one of the things that, that I've found over more than 40 years in, in industry is that the way senior management thinks and the way a program manager thinks are completely different from each other. Um, everybody understands about planning, for example. You know how you plan. If you're a business manager, you know how you plan. If you're a project manager, you know how you plan. The difference is the same word means two totally different things in the two different contexts. For example, if you're a business manager, plans always start by looking at what did we do last year? What's the known basis to what we do? Um, and the way we get to our plans for this year is we look at what we did last year and we look at how it needs to change to make it fit for purpose for this year and into the future. So planning starts from the basis of a known reality and moves into a kind of unknown, uh, hoped for future. In projects, it's almost turning the telescope around the other way because what you start with in a project isn't a known reality. What you start with is a dream. You start with a wish. You start with a desire. You start with somebody's intention that you're going to end up with um, the results of the program, either in the form of a new service or a new product or something delivered. But when you set out you do not know for sure that it's doable. You don't have a basis of a known uh, baseline. You have your best guess as to what's going to need to be done in order to deliver it. That's a very different activity. In fact, there's a psychologist uh, working at Leeds University called Michael Curtin who's been doing work over 40 years who's been looking at the way people tend to think. And he's, he's found that whereas 95% of the population are very comfortable starting from a known base and adapting it, 
only about 5% of the population are comfortable starting with an idea and inventing something that's going to get to that idea. So we might be looking at a situation where 50% of the work we do in the world is in the form of projects, and yet only 5% of the people in the world are naturally cut out to do the kind of planning needed by projects, whereas everybody is really comfortable doing the kind of work uh, that is needed in business as usual. Um, it goes on even more than that, because when you're talking about, about uh, um, plans, it's one thing, but then, then look at risks, because people in business understand what a risk is. A risk is something that isn't usually happening. It might happen, and if it does happen, it's going to have serious consequences. I'll leave aside the rather um, theological debate about whether risks includes opportunities or whether they're something somewhat different. But um, the, in, in the world of business, you know what a risk is, and you can take contingency steps to plan for it. The trouble is with planning done in the way it is in projects and programs, you actually don't know what your risks are because you don't know the extent to which your plan is actually able to deliver what it is that you expect to. So risks are absolutely inherent to every single item of planning when you're talking in the project and program world. So we've got two different mindsets, and the trouble is when you sit down around the table to talk about what you're going to do next year, which is usually a mixture of operations and programs, you talk about planning as if you mean the same thing, and actually we mean something very different. So it does seem to me that, that it's, it's a really important area that, that has all kinds of knock-on effects. For example, <clears throat> if, we, if we look at these different uh, 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 in environments, one of the ways we see the knock-on effects of this, for example, is that we set it up so that the purpose of a project or a program team is totally different from the purpose of a management team. The purpose of a project team is to deliver. The purpose of a management team is to survive and prosper. And those are totally different goals. So you're asking people to do very different things. And indeed, um, the project world is the abnormal one. It's not something that the human animal is evolved for. The human animal is evolved for survival and is pretty good at making it up as it goes along in order to safeguard its own security. Um, so this Air, this yellow and orange area is, is, is an unnatural one psychologically, and it's an unnatural one environmentally. Um, so this is based also, it sounds like, on the mindsets, the differences around certainty and uncertainty. Absolutely. And that uncertainty drives a project manager more towards the total research uh, results orientation, uh, while it's in a traditional larger business setting. It's uh, certainly results, but it's also how are we you know, keeping ourselves going exactly. for the future. Exactly. Yeah. So if you're a manager, for example, in a, bit, in, in a permanent organization, you care about continuity. You care about having a, a long-term right. supply of people of the right level of skills. You, you care about building up a competency profile. Okay. If you're a project manager, you don't care about that. You care about getting the stuff out of the door. And you do what you need to do to get delivery. stuff out of the door. It's all about delivery. Yeah. And, um, and nothing else is in your terms of reference. So... You're, you're separating this out in, in a very different kind of way. Now, what this can mean is uh, things can appear counterintuitive. So some things that work in the world of business have exactly the opposite effect in the world of projects. And if we just have a look at, uh, at the next chart, this is an actual uh, chart from a court case um, where one of the suppliers to the Channel Tunnel was suing Channel Tunnel Limited for the... Um, the cost overrun and delay that they caused and uh, this, this was a particular piece of forensic uh, examination done by the University of Strathclyde to look at it mm. and um, what, what they, if you look carefully at that particular systems diagram of events and we'll see a couple of areas um, which we can highlight in red that will show us that we've, we've actually got vicious circles operating. There's a vicious circle operating where the later the project gets, 
the more thinking in terms of traditional management, you say, okay, so let's just do more work in parallel. But doing more work in parallel, in fact, means that you then start to create additional work. Not only that, when you find that you've done work uh, and the additional rework doesn't mesh with it, you've then got rework to do. So you get a vicious circle where there is more and more work to do and less and less time to do it in. And actually, by taking what seem perfectly sensible uh, decisions in a business as usual environment you end up driving the project into the ground um, we see that particularly if we can have a look at the uh, at the book and at the plane it'll come on next um, when you start to look at complexity I've missed out some of my tips on my way through here by the way because um, I'm, I'm going to need to backtrack a little on this um, uh, because in the points that I've made about this, these two business points, what I want to say here um, is that the more complex the work becomes, the more the job of a program manager actually is about managing the social complexity in the project and the less it is about understanding the technical nature of the problem. The problem that you're seeing there in the channel tunnel, although it's caused by technical working, is not a technical problem. It's a human problem caused by people taking decisions under pressure, making decisions that end up being counterproductive and not having the means of spotting that and changing their behavior. So, so one of the key tips, I think, for talent management in a, an increasingly project-dominated world is that you, as complexity increases, so the need for social skills among the people that you give the work to um, increases. Mm -hmm. Related to that is another tip, which says you can't understand what kind of job to assign people to unless you understand the nature of the particular projects and programs. And that is not an easy task. So that's another tip there, which is you can't do talent management simply by looking at the people. You also have to look at the nature of the projects and programs that you're assigning the people to without systems of doing that. The context. Again, one you person in one situation exactly. is very successful, but then exactly. the dynamics change and exactly. not so much. Exactly. So. And, and what we found in, in, in um, project-based organizations is that that means that the task of talent management needs to be owned by a triumvirate. It needs to be owned by, owned by the project people who understand the nature of projects. It needs to be owned by the HR people who understand what's needed in terms of developing uh, people. And it needs to be owned by the businesses because they're the ones who need the results. So you can't run a talent management system without the, this triumvirate all having an equal voice somehow in the decision making. Yeah, which would lead obviously then to your views that in order to have success, it requires organizations working cross lines effectively together. Exactly. And exactly. probably where you have failures, you see the stove piping where people are holding back on information, yes, controlling it, so it, it increases the likelihood of having problems. Yes, you do. Right. And, and if businesses don't understand the nature of this, then they'll, they'll try to impose governance systems that work in business as usual, for example, uh, in the case of projects. And, and it just won't work because the project team has got so much information at its fingertips and understands its context so well that the task of continually educating senior management in that context, the context is changing faster than they can educate them. So if you try to use traditional governance methods in a project-based organization, you're going to end up in all kinds of trouble, which raises interesting questions as well, because talent management needs to cover not only the people who are managing the projects and programs, but it needs to cover the people who are governing the people who are managing the projects and programs, as I think you right. probably agree. Yeah, it's the... Uh I guess it's like Deming years ago, who when he was doing his quality, you know, programs, that if senior leadership didn't stay in the room while he was talking to the workforce, he would leave because it was the notion that we're all in it together. And so you have to have senior leadership, which in a program would be a portfolio, but you also then have the, the workforce and the, exactly. uh, the practitioners exactly. aligned. That's right. Yeah. That's absolutely right. So, so that's the first two items on the agenda that I've talked about. What I think I've done so far, if I just uh, touch base, is I, I hope I've made out a case that says that um, based on the work done by PMI and COSI and uh, MIT and backed up with our own research, talent management absolutely lies at the heart of success. Talent management defined in terms of having the right people managing the right projects, so having leadership right the way up through the organization. 
And then I think the second point that I hope I've made is that it's not a simple matter in project-based organisations to just relate what you normally do in the business to projects because projects need a completely different set of uh, rules um, because they're a different nature of work to um, the other kind of work. So let's have a look then. Um, oh, no, I've still got... Uh, uh, Evidence that this is not fully understood comes from a piece of research that uh, my colleague Lynn Crawford and I recently did. And if I move on to this, to the chart called In Terms of Developing Capability. And this is an interesting piece of research because typically the research into project-based organizations looks at uh, the project management world. Mm -hmm. It takes a project management view and it talks to project managers. This particular piece of research that was published uh, last year um, under the title Best Industry Outcomes by PMI, uh, the sample is, is shown on that picture there. So you can see virtually 50% of the sample, and it's a sample of 420 or so um, uh, uh, people, um, are, are in general management. A number are in project management, but others are drawn from finance and elsewhere. And this was looking at the extent to which project and program management practice needs to differ in different organizational contexts. Um, and we were, we were actually quite pleased to be able to show just how much it does vary. For example, when uh, in different industries judge success very differently. So if we have a look at, the, at how industries judge success, one of the factors we looked at was market share, which if you're a fast-moving consumer goods company is highly significant. If you're the federal government, it's very insignificant. You're in a, you're in a minority of, of, of one, um, and you have a monopoly position, um, I, I guess at least as well where, where federal government is concerned. Uh, you have to understand this is a very uneducated layman's point of view and I may say all <laughs> kinds of things that are, uh, don't look that way when you're on the inside, but I can understand why the well, government we'll have agencies... a panel that follow, <laughs> follows you of federal leaders. So we'll, exactly. Yeah. Uh, but you can see that this is what, the, when, when people in government say that market share is not a significant factor, then I, I'm right. willing to take their word for it. Yeah. Rather more interestingly perhaps, uh, uh, we can look at the challenges they face and we'll see that here you find that in terms of political and social complexity, which is the kind of program that calls for the highest kind of social skills, as we've made an earlier point, government comes out right at the top. Actually, government programs have more social and political complexity in them than almost any other. So here we're, 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 we're saying that the particular context of, of um, uh, federal work calls for a particularly high level of uh, program management capability characterized by a very high degree of social skills. Yeah, the ability to work with people, uh, building the team, uh, political savvy, all those factors become more important. Exactly. Yeah. But then, then what's interesting is the, the, the practices that, that are adopted. And, and there's, there's a lot of research that shows that the practice in project and program management more than any other that uh, uh, governs success is portfolio management. So if you just look at the extent to which portfolio management is practiced differently, for example, um, you'll see that less than 10% of government agencies practice, um, uh, this is not, uh, this is a sample based on the UK, on Australia, and on the USA, by the way, so it's not, uh, uh, not, not, not all federal, but there's a significant right. number of federal experiences in there. Um, uh, it, it, it actually isn't practiced, and, and I was doing some work with the Australian government recently, and what they call portfolio management is actually individual major defense programs, for example, each have their own equivalent of congressional uh, oversight and approval, and so they then lump those together into like programs, and they call it a portfolio. But in fact, none of the levers of portfolio management exist because actually each individual program is governed separately by its own oversight committee. So they're using a label portfolio management without using any of the practices that lie. And, uh, and just briefly, it. what is portfolio management? Well, portfolio management says that you, uh, you, you allocate the resources of the organization proportionately so that you get the best strategic outcome uh, consistent with what the organization is seeking to accomplish. Okay. So a place like NASA would be a balance of human exploration, science missions, uh, aeronautics. And exactly. So what, okay. whatever, whatever your administrator what has. has in a sense, if you're using right. portfolio management, then the chief executive will agree with the shareholders 
the strategic goals for the enterprise and is, will then use portfolio management to make the best possible use of the human and other resources at their disposal mm. in order to deliver the contracted uh, strategy. Right. Yeah, part of what's surprising, which is interesting in terms of what we present, and you're saying over there, if I read it correctly, that the government in general does little portfolio uh, yes. and wouldn't be the case at NASA, but, but you're saying that, that there, and yet you're saying that in government programs the most important maybe consideration for success is the political, social considerations. Exactly. So you would almost expect they would both line up. More. You would, yeah. you would, and they don't, and, okay. the, and, and it's a contextual matter. And, yeah. and uh, just to, to, to underline the point about success, if we look at the next chart, you can see just what a difference the good practice of portfolio management mm. makes. Um, those organizations that do use portfolio management uh, extremely well achieve much closer to their 100% benefits than, 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 than any of the others do. Um, so I, th I think there are some, some, some interesting points that emerge from that. So if we can move on, I, I'd like to uh, share some uh, results of uh, some comparisons we've done between the way organizations actually develop workforces against the background of what we've, uh, what we've discussed. Um, and the workforce development assessment is just one of the uh, aspects of organizational behavior that we, we benchmark uh, compared to, uh, the, we look at the characteristics of the portfolio, we look to the organization's overall processes, and we look to how they deploy those processes. Um, if I can look at the next chart, please, as you'll see, um, we're, we're comparing here organizations in government with organizations that aren't in government, and the examples of, of, of the kind of organizations that are in this sample, um, they'll, they'll be, many of them will be brand names that you'll recognize if we can have a look at those. Um, so th these, are, these are organizations that care enough about what they're doing to be willing to be uh, benchmarked um, ag against others that care about it. Um, and as far as I'm aware, this is the only study of its kind that's, that's done at the moment. Um, we look at a range of topics, at, uh, at five different topics broken up into subtopics. If we can move on, please. Um, and those, when we look at these, if we move on, we'll see that the organizations show quite a wide range of maturity. The, the point that I want to make there, when I'm looking at the things that generally people do badly, with the notable exception of NASA, um, there are very limited development activities yeah, for project and program that. teams. You did not pay yeah, me no. to say that. No, 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 no I hasten to say. Um, uh, but then this, this I will include, Nasser, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you a backhander beyond that. Um, we find that organizations uh, lag way behind the leaders in terms of their use of e-learning um, in a sophisticated manner. Mm. Um, a, a lot of e-learning that's practiced is pretty humdrum stuff, um, simply a matter of removing boring classroom stuff and putting it onto equally boring online material over which there is very little control. Um, whereas the most sophisticated companies in the, uh, um, in the comparator group actually use e-learning as a way of ensuring that every minute of their face-to-face -face time delivers the maximum possible value. Um, you'll see some of the other generic lows there that I'll pick out as we, pick, uh, uh, as we move through it. Next, please. Um, most organizations now have recognized that they need, uh, you'll see there's a grouping in the top right-hand corner there of the, of, of the dots around um, developing a project and program management community. And most organizations now recognize that they do need to uh, um, develop uh, some kind of project and program community as a precursor to having any kind of talent management program. Uh, however, when we start to looking at the delivery of development, next please, this is where things start to, and, and let's have a look at the two pie charts, uh, where, where things start to develop. These, these are actually the top rated organization and the second rated organization, and you can see how very different from each other the way they spend their money are. Um, uh, the top one spends a large amount of, uh, of its budget on uh, developing teams in role. Um, the bottom, which is the, the one who is best on the e-learning, develops a, a significant amount of its budget to e-learning. So another couple of tips I would pull out here for the uh, uh, federal talent management is firstly, since projects and programs are delivered by teams, 
teams should really be the focus of where you spend your time developing the talents. And the second one would be that there's a, a, you can use e-learning to improve the effectiveness and efficiency of just about everything else that you do. Move on, please. Because one or two organizations, including your own, are, doing, uh, are setting really good trends by linking uh, web-based social media techniques to knowledge management and linking the knowledge management to learning from experience. And if we pick out a few of the examples of good practice on the next chart, um, yourself, I think the, um, the Masters uh, with Masters program and your use of Twitter, I see some questions coming in from Twitter yeah. even now uh, as, we, as we speak. Uh, Shell have got their own internal uh, YouTube service that they call ShellTube. Uh, Bombardier uh, um, uh, use uh, uh, Google as an extremely effective way of allowing anybody in the organization to access the knowledge, given that in, nowadays there's people out there use Google all the time. The interesting question is how do you get the knowledge in a form that it's Googleable? And BG Group, for example, have done some extremely good work in identifying the process you have to go through to extract a really good lesson that is generalizably learned and they use that as a, as, as a means of uh, gaining it in a knowledge book that can then be googled. On to the next one please, you can see uh, uh, the, the kind of online resources there, that should be music to your yeah. own uh, ears, mm -hmm. seeing your own, your own charts fed back to you. But uh, next please, I think there's generally been a lot of good reception to the UK Summer Olympics last year. Mm. And what people don't realize is the massive amount of uh, really powerful work that went on behind the scenes. And in one area, I think they really can claim to be doing excellent work in, in knowledge management. Um, and if any of you are interested, you can just go to a, a, a website called Learning Legacy, learninglegacy.com, and you'll see this particular web page here where you'll see a massive variety of lessons learned in a variety of ways uh, that is available for anybody to learn. One of the things that I think is particularly praiseworthy is where they felt that certain aspects were going uh, wrong, like in transport policy, they hired uh, the leading university that they could find in that area to do a live case um, w with open books for them and then they published the research report as part of this learning from experience so if you go onto the website you can see what was actual research done on a live case as it was going that resulted in a change of transport policy yeah, for so example. in the London Olympics they weren't just satisfied with the stunning success they had they were obviously looking at you know the lesson learning the lessons and having that knowledge available to others. Exactly. That, they were determined amazing. that they were going to have the stunning success. Yeah. And in fact, that's one of right. the way places that I, I haven't put this in as a TEP for federal, federal agency, but I'd offer it as a thought process. One of the things that the London Olympics did was when they realized early on how critically important project controls were going to be, they went out and headhunted the best project controls person they could find anywhere in the world. And in fact, they hired somebody from CH2M Hill and made them planning director of the, uh, of the London Olympics. And uh, um, that's one of the ways that you have to be in a fast-paced, project-based world, be able to respond by hiring the best talent. Right. Um, you can't always develop it internally. Uh, finally, uh, some other random good practices uh, that we've seen here. Um, uh, you can make extremely effective use of Saturn, which I know is a federal um, uh, uh, program, if it's supplemented by other administrative tools in order to administer uh, uh, items well so tips number eight and nine for me would be make sure you do li link talent management to knowledge management and learning from experience and make sure you use your administration of your talent management proactively so that it's giving you a lot more metrics and a lot more information as to how effective you're being and and finally I've put down there that KPIs relate performance to business goals beyond Kirkpatrick level four I think that Companies that are organizations that are really focused on talent are absolutely preoccupied with measurement. They're, um, they're you use the word obsessed. Obsessed, it's, exactly. It's, it's obsessed strong. with, yeah. with okay. measurement because I think that's something that's really, really powerful. 
So those are, those are the good practices I wanted to share. And if I can move on to the final uh, one of my four areas quickly, it seems to me that, that there are three polarities that every organization has to grapple with if they're going to get this business of talent management sorted out. And a polarity is something, I, I, I've used the picture of the yin and yang there, because a polarity is something that could be at one end of a spectrum or could be at another, um, but it can't be at both usually. Um, and in the West, we tend to flip-flop between we'll try it at one end and then we'll be aware of everything goes wrong, so we'll flip to the other end. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the East, there's a tendency to try and match the two uh, uh, in, in a more comfortable way. The first one I've already hinted at, it's the balancing the need to develop long-term capability with, on the other hand, getting delivery out the door. And this is a perennial problem, and the more we do project-based work, mm. the more this problem's going to hit us. So talent management must take account of that. Next, please. <clears throat> then the next one is, is something that universities are grappling with, in many cases poorly, because they're tending to separate out their teaching staff from their research staff, and they're tending to incentivize them differently. Whereas the reality is, if you think of research as finding out new stuff, and teaching is spreading the stuff that we already know, every organization has got to find the right balance between making sure they're doing well what they do do well, and also that they're operating at the edge and improving. How are you going to balance that? How do you make sure that your knowledge management is at least as much about finding out new stuff as it is about spreading what you've already got? And then thirdly, uh, as someone who spent a lot of his time in standards, I think the that there's another one of these polarities between specifying standard frameworks to which everybody needs to conform so that you've got a manageable business and on the other hand um, adapting the practices to the particular context that you need to to operate in um, I've seen those moving uh, in future directions because as the we had a conference at the PMI, um, a research and education conference in Limerick last year in, in Ireland. It was a great setting and it was a great conference. And there were two really significant things that, that, that emerged for me. The first one is to say that something that's being known, being talked about in project management circles as project management 2.0 got real credible um, exposure, if we can have a look at that. Um, and I was interested in that because I first heard Project Management 2.0 talked about at an event you were at, Ed, mm. two years ago, right. when John Coy, an innovation authority, started talking about he was hearing things that added up to Project Management 2.0. And I've spoken about it and I've written about it. But then Ray Levitt, um, a professor of, of project management at Stanford University, was really underlining how critically important it is that in a world where... Um, Empowerment is moving down so that it's happening too fast to allow everything to happen in a hierarchical way. And if we look at the next piece as well, in a world where knowledge is available instantly, PM 2.0 is a reality. It's, it's here now. Some people are using it and some aren't. And finally, um, we had a great presentation from Denise Russo, who is a past president of the Academy of Management. And she was talking about how critically important it is that we integrate our metrics with our practice and our research with our practice and she's a primary exponent of evidence-based management and uh, if we look at she 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 i think grabbed us all by pointing out that the uh, the well publicized uh, um, miraculous escape when uh, chesney sullenberger actually got the whole of his passengers and crew out safely when he had to crash land his aircraft in the uh, hudson he is a brilliant exponent of evidence-based management. He's a visiting scholar on catastrophic risk. He has spent his life doing research on how to take decisions on safety under extreme stress. It was no accident that all of his people came out alive. That's the kind of talent we're looking to nurture within the federal workforce. Hopefully it won't always be faced uh, with, with a potential risk of that high, but nevertheless that's mm. what we're doing. Very so good. with that I think that's, those are the four key things I'd want to say. Right. Fascinating stuff. You've covered a lot, a lot of ground. And in the, the, the time we have uh, with you, Charlie, we'll go through some of the questions that we have and uh, maybe we'll have time to uh, go over to some of the other areas. 
Um, one of the questions we have through Ustream uh, from Uzan uh, Kara is, uh, what do you think about organizations in how they develop young professionals uh, in, in this new world you're talking about, which I would see as a opportunity because it's always easiest to go into a new world when you're young and starting out and you, you're seeing things differently. So what do you see in terms of how organizations are approaching the development of, of young professionals? I think they're slow to react. I think that there, there are some very good things happening. Organizations are slow and, to and react, not young orga, professionals. Organizations like are slow to react. I, I see in, in, in many organizations, I hear the story that young professionals are coming in, spending two or three years in an organization, then leaving because actually they're not finding the work style to their, to, to their liking. Um, one defense contractor has done a certain amount of research into the expectations of young professionals. And it was very interesting. This, I, I first saw this three or four years ago, and at the time there was an absolute cutoff at the age of 30, so I guess that would be 34 or 35 now, that youngster, uh, people under that age were absolutely at home with social media. They, they valued connectedness over control, mm. and therefore they were looking for a work environment in which the organization supported them by making it easy for them to connect and easy for them to use their initiative. Whereas, of course, people, you, you've, you've, you can give me a good few years, but, but people who are nearing the end of their working life, or in my case, well past their sell-by date, um, actually find that um, we value control more than we value connectedness, and we'll sacrifice connectedness in order to get control, and that creates an environment in which young people are just not happy. And I don't see many organizations doing a great job of coping with that, other than the young high-tech startups, which is, of course, attracting all of the talent of, that, of the younger people. Yeah. Actually, your work is getting better as you get older, so <laughs> you another, you know, you've got a long way to go. Yeah. Um, you talk about connected, so young professionals, you know, you're seeing a desire more of a connectiveness, and uh, the generation we grew up with, heavy emphasis on control. Yes. You know, you know, it's uh, which again gets a little bit connections back maybe to the mindsets. It does. You're talking it does. about. It and does. So what? Except, except what do you? Generation of one. What do you? I mean, are there ways to deal with that or? Well, there's been some interesting work done um, by a CSIS, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, and MIT for the Pentagon, um, which was actually looking specifically at complexity. But it was, it, 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 it was looking at alternative ways of governing enterprises. It was looking at kind of, um, how shall I say, um, almost neurological control um, in the way that the web is controlled um, as opposed to the hierarchical control of a command and control structure of an organization that, that I grew up in, for example. So I think that organizations that are willing to take risks but they have to then find ways of ring fencing those risks so that if something goes badly wrong, catastrophically wrong in one of those areas, they're not betting the whole farm on a particular result. So mm -hmm. I think that they've got to become more willing to take risks in different areas and ring fence them from any, any damage. But on the other hand, um, allow success. It's the old bit about innovation, the attacker's advantage, um, really set up structures that will reward those uh, groups headed by young professionals that are growing fast. I think mean, it's a really interesting question. Yeah. No, Great it is. question. And I know with the uh, panel we have coming up, there's a lot of work being done uh, with young professionals, and so I'm sure we'll, we'll hear about that uh, specifically from the organizations. Um, another question we have is from Sarah Rigdon uh, through Twitter. And the question here is, for those who are watching who know little about project management, uh, can you talk a little bit about the field and how it has developed in organizations that you've studied? Oh, Which, wow. Now, this, you can, this can end up being <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I'll, a few I'll, days I'll with do it Terry 30 Cook. seconds. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, no, no. yeah, yeah. project so. management, it actually has changed over the years. It, it, it grew up at the back end of the Second World War, and I guess the, the, the point of origin of project management would have to be the Manhattan Project. And um, they found that they had to develop new techniques to get delivery quickly. But then that rapidly became a control mechanism. And with uh, um, cost control and schedule control, um, 
project management tended to become focused on the processes of managing projects. Nowadays, I think it's moving back again, and I think we're seeing projects as a context like the Manhattan Project, which is how can you set up a management system that is going to deliver what we need effectively um, and rapidly um, uh, in, the most, um, in the most sensible way we can. So we're going to see more improvisation, I think, as what I've been saying, by more talented people who understand the context. Yeah, so the... the uh the genesis of project organizations were typically to focus in on one, you know, typically a complex yes. issue that couldn't be done, that had to be done with multidisciplinary yes. expertise with a focus on cost and time, and led to a lot of the advanced skills uh, and tools. Yes. But a lot of them geared towards trying to get greater control. And uh, part of what you're saying is we're living now in a world where uh, uncertainty has increased. There are many more interfaces that play into it and so those social skills become more important and exactly. you're, you're, you're predicting or you're seeing a change in the nature of project management to include those tools for gaining control but also uh, more focus on leadership and the ability for innovative approaches. It, it, is that what you... That's exactly what I'm okay. saying. And yeah. there's also why you see things like Agile sprouting I think up they absolutely. They're trying I think to address they, they have their that. place in it. They do indeed. And lean methods. Yeah. Um, another question uh, that came from Sarah uh, through Twitter was, do you know of any e-learning formats or programs that have been most successful? So you talked, uh, for example, in the benchmarking that uh, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the top organizations is heavily involved in electronic learning. Yes. And in uh, getting materials and, and content to their people virtually. Um, we, we've all experienced cases where e-learning has not been optimal. So what are the characteristics of why you, why you felt that particular organization was so good? What, what did they do and, you know, you know, what formats or what programs made it effective, the e-learning? Okay. Well, let, let's just say you're going to pull together, um, which I know that you do, a, a, a core curriculum event for very senior people for two weeks face to face. Um, if those people come without having been prepared and without having the necessary background knowledge and without having the necessary skills, then you're only going to get half the effectiveness of some very expensive people's time. Now this organization that I was talking about would actually have all of the prerequisites on an e-learning program that would also include knowledge and um, uh, um, capability tests and only when you've passed that can you then come to the face-to-face -face meeting so that you're absolutely confident that people who are face-to-face -face know what they need to know and can do what they need to do so that their time together is well spent. That to me is a good example but of course that does mean that you have to develop the e-learning uh, to the particular curriculum. It's not, it's not the kind of thing where you can buy it out of the box. Right. That's yeah. why it's expensive. So it's basically it's, it's using the technologies as a leverage to improve how yes. we work together yes. as opposed to trying to do uh, one of the examples of that within NASA we uh, we had a pro we have a project management systems engineering course because of the uh, the tight economics we wanted to shorten the days for different reasons and so we we use components that are now uh, pre-work yeah. and uh, you know the concern is always will people use it but in order to get into the course you have to have gone through the uh, the amount of pre-work and then so we exactly. shave that kind exactly. of time exactly. and uh, so you see obviously more I do. more of, of that and obviously this is a, a, a form of that being able to I'm always interested by we have a session here and obviously we have a uh, live audience but the larger audience is typically those who watch afterwards and, and where it goes so it's it has a lot of connections for for different ways of but, going but I mean the world is showing us how to do it for example if, if, if I come across something and I need to use a particular technique in Excel or in, in, in a statistics program, what I do nowadays is I go to YouTube. Right. I go to YouTube and I find, I, I, I find a three-minute YouTube clip and mm -hmm. typically I gain the skill at the point that I need it, at the time that I need it because there's a clip available. So again, that's I think another use where you can, where you can make short instructional videos that, that actually show something being done that's available then at the point of need. Right, yeah. No, YouTube is a great example. I mean, we do these these run for an hour or some point, but we'll, we'll post components on YouTube, and then the numbers just 
you know, dramatically because people are looking for that quick answer. Exactly. A minute, two minutes. Uh, we have a question from John Verve uh, through Twitter. And uh, this is a uh, question. What should NASA do about project management 2.0 uh, uh, as, as the new way of doing things as it relates to knowledge management? And uh, so, um, so, so project management 2.0, maybe... Okay. What do you see as Project okay. 2.0, and then how does it relate to, to, to knowledge management? What I see about Project Management 2.0 is that it's a hybrid of multiple uh, methods that include Agile and Lean. So instead of being dependent upon a big, heavy, top-down, waterfall type, get the requirements first and then build to them, you actually are much more iterative and able to adapt. And I think it, it, it applies itself, uh, and it, it, it allows much greater commitment and freedom to the project team. You're much clearer about the what's for the governance and you leave the how's to the project team, in, in typically in, in, in PM 2.0. Um, and you allow them to assemble the resources that they need to get it done. So I think in terms of knowledge management, that's absolutely great because where I see knowledge management working, it's where people can demonstrate that their performance is hindered by a lack of knowledge. That's where you get an immediate payoff. If you can provide people with the knowledge they need that previously has been lacked. Now, if you can break that down into a series of, um, uh, of sprints, of, of short projects to deliver particular types of knowledge to particular types of people, I think that you could actually kill two birds with one stone or even three and both experiment with um, a light touch PM 2.0 but use it to deliver quickly um, right. elements of a knowledge strategy. Yeah, part of also what you're saying is that in a project world we're in, uh, heavy uncertainty, need for quick innovations, and in a, in a knowledge world, you know, at least a couple of things you want is when you have a problem or a challenge, you want to know to who or where to find that answer as quick as possible yes, to help you with the decision. If you want to have... You know, you know, systems in place that facilitate that. And when you have lessons that you've learned, like you, you use the great example of the London Olympics, how do you make sure that people get that? Exactly. And are you in an organization that takes the time and encourages that? It's exactly. a key component. So, you see, they, they go together. Uh, coming to the final few minutes of this segment, we have a couple more questions. Um, and from Phalanx on Twitter, uh, what are the best practices so journeyman professionals can better bridge the gap between more senior management and uh, looks like young professionals. So what are best practices for um, bridging the gap between being, I guess, a practitioner, journeyman professional, and uh, and senior leadership? I think that uh, people are going to feel that, uh, that, that you've paid me to say this again, Ed, because I have to honestly say that one of the best practices I've seen in this field is your Project HOPE. I think that actually the best way that I know of allowing people to, be to develop talent in the field is by giving them the actual experience of carrying a project, including full accountability for all of the results. Mm. And your hands-on project experience project does exactly that. And I would say, you, you, you'll, you'll know better than me, I haven't spoken to yourself or to Christine about this, um, but I would have thought that the people who successfully deliver um, on your project hope are uh, people who are managing to continue that journeyman journey. I, I, I like the language that uh, the, the questioner aren't put there because I do think that learning in the project and program space is situated learning. It's the kind of learning that used to be handed on in a craft guild. It's the kind of learning from shaping the actual material and the actual context rather than from abstract book learning. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. And just to, to clarify, HOPE stands for Hands-On hands -on project, project Experience, experience. which is a program that uh, NASA has done uh, uh, with the uh, Science Mission Directorate, where it's an actual one-year project, and people get the experience. The first objective is learning, and the second is to, to get the result. So it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, excellent. So hands-on exactly. is the way, they've and then having leadership yep. and the practitioners see each other, talk to each other, ask, you know, ask the different questions. I think, you know, from time standpoint, we probably have time for one question, uh, which we have here from Stu Beck on Ustream. In your general opinion, what type of person makes for a better 
program project manager. So from your, from your life experience, from your research, from being there, uh, when you're looking for a project manager or if you have someone you're going to mentor, uh, what makes someone uh, better at program project management? It's really interesting because I've been fortunate enough to meet many program directors and program managers of big, multi-billion dollar, high-profile programs. And I can honestly say that I have never met one of them that I would classify as a bully. Every one of them has turned out to be a nicer person than I had ever expected possible to deliver such programs. And the reason for that, it's no accident. It's because they value the people for whom they are working. A project management is all overhead. Projects don't deliver anything. People deliver results. And a program manager is somebody who's capable of getting the best out of the people. And without exception, the better program managers are the people who are better at getting good results out of people. Now, life skills, you start to learn. I don't know whether it's in the, room, in the womb now, but you certainly start learning in the first six months of life. So I have a real problem with a view that says you take people that are good technically and then teach them people skills because it seems to me that people skills take longer to learn for all of us than technical skills. So there is considerable research out there that suggests that it's easier to teach people with good people skills the technical knowledge they need to manage a technical project than vice versa. Yeah. And yet I see organizations around the world who continually say we'll take our best engineers and we'll hope that we can find some of them that are good with people. You've now some probably started a major controversy <laughs> and we're out of time for questions. But yeah, it's an interesting uh, Point, and it, it's consistent with your notion success through people that we're living in a day where there's a lot of complexity and the work is being done through projects and if it's true and I you know I believe that um, the the key skills have to do with how do we work effectively together yes uh, most projects are partnerships with industry government agencies often international partners universities and so it, it's right. pulling together people who if they want to work together and they're engaged uh, you lead to one thing, and if they don't like each other, it, it can go in a different direction. That's right. So it's always fascinating to to talk, you know, with you, Terry. I have a feeling, uh, are we at the time, or do we have time for anything else? Okay, now I'm being told that we're out of time. So thank you, Terry Cook. My pleasure. Davids, it's a pleasure. I always learn something new.